So here we go again. A while back, I made a video about Glenn Fricker and Spectre Studio Sound. It was a little clickbaity title, clickbaity thumbnail, where it looked like I was going to try to destroy Glenn's reputation. But the truth is, I agree with him on stuff like pickups and tubes and speakers and, and a bunch of other stuff. But anyway, that video isn't the subject of this video. In that video, I mention another guitarist. He's from Nashville. His name's Jim Lill. He's got a YouTube channel with about 14 videos on it. Got a ton of views. And he does experiments where he tries to determine where sustain comes from, what actually creates tone in guitars. And he does a really good job. And I mentioned him in the Glenn Fricker video, as I said. And on that video, I got hundreds and hundreds of comments. I couldn't possibly respond to them all. So um, that's part of the point behind today's video. Most people were supportive of Glenn Fricker. Most of them were supportive of Jim Lill. But there was a small handful like this guy. He says, Jim's experiments are anything but scientific. Now, for those of you who have the attention span of a fruit fly and don't want to watch this video, five or six minutes, whatever it is, I'll save you some time. I think Jim's experiments are scientific and I will explain why, but for those of you with the fruit fly attention span, let me just ask you a question. What would you have him do to be more scientific? And I'll follow that up with another question. What have you done that is more scientific? What have you done on video that you can show to us? If you leave a comment down below, don't be snarky. Just just be honest. Tell me what you think he could do better to make it more scientific. And if you have done something, leave a link and don't be ashamed about it. Just be civil. All right, let's grab some more coffee and then we'll look at my evidence. All right, so that guy says Jim's videos are anything but scientific. Well, what's science? Science! So the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary defines science as knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through scientific method. You might want to go back and reread that a couple times and let it sink in. It's a pretty good definition of science. Science! Brings up a question, what's the scientific method? Well, let's take a look. Principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. I would argue that for your data collection and your experimentation, that your results need to be measurable and repeatable. They need to be measurable in an accepted form of measurement for whatever it is you're working on. If your results are not consistent, then there's another variable at work here that you're not taking into consideration. Let's say we're doing a comparison between two speakers. We want to determine how they sound, right? And so we get, uh, we get some clown banging out an E chord. <laughs> into a looper, and then we plug that looper into the amp of our choice. We plug that amp into a speaker cabinet. We pick a mic for micing it up, and then all we do is we change the speaker. So we've got speaker A and speaker B for this example. Now let's say Jeremy comes in and he listens and he says, speaker A sounds warm, but speaker B sounds brittle and harsh. Well, then Ryan comes in and he's like, speaker A sounds muddy and speaker B sounds bright and articulate. Well, those aren't measurable responses. You measure warm in degrees, so that's fine for your oven. It's not a measurable component of sound. Our guy says, oh, it sounds bright and articulate. All right, well, bright, you measure that with lumens. You can't measure lumens on a speaker. You can on a light bulb. Science! But not on a speaker. Articulate, that's somebody who's got a good vocabulary. What, he's saying that this speaker has a good vocabulary? Of course not. He's trying to use non-scientific language to describe something specific. What would be a scientific way of describing it? Well, I would say get a frequency response chart. It's simply a graph that shows how many decibels are produced at any given frequency when a particular signal is fed through that speaker. The range is usually 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Why? Because that's the range of human hearing. And if 
we discover that speaker A has got a pronounced peak around 650 hertz, and speaker B's got a pronounced peak around 2000 hertz, and I'm just picking these numbers out of the air. Once we do that, once we know that speaker A's got a bump at around 650, and speaker B has got a bump around 2000, those are scientific descriptions of the two speakers and illustrate the differences. If if Jeremy thinks speaker A sounds warm and Ryan thinks it sounds muddy, that's an opinion. But to say speaker A has got a bump around 650 hertz, that's a fact. That's scientific, it's measurable, and it's repeatable. So does Jim Lil use frequency response charts? Play a sweep test from the rig into each mic and the computer can make a graph out of it. If I put two or more mics on the screen, it can show exactly how different they are from each other. That certainly seemed like a valid frequency response test. This looks like a frequency response chart here. And so does this, and this, and this, and this. And you get the idea. Jim uses frequency response <laughs> measurements to get scientific answers to his tests. He also builds contraptions and, and fixtures to make sure that the things that are supposed to remain constant during his experiments actually remain constant. The only thing changing is the variable that he's testing. So does Jim do frequency response tests for all his experiments? No, because some of his experiments are simply to determine whether or not you can hear the difference. He had somebody imply that because YouTube does something, some sort of compression to the audio, that that invalidates his video experiments. Jim had a pretty good response to that. Here it is. I do remember reading about how YouTube converts audio to AAC format, which uses perceptual encoding that splits the audio into separate frequency bands and for any given chunk of time, assigns an appropriately sized bit rate to each frequency band, prioritizing info that will be audible and spending fewer resources on info that won't be audible because of the phenomenon where our basilar membrane is curled up inside our cochlea and senses frequencies from high to low as you go deeper into the spiral. And when part of the membrane vibrates from a loud sound, the areas directly around it become less sensitive to softer sounds, so the perceived sound quality would be minimally affected if the nearby frequency bands with the soft sounds were allotted fewer bits than the frequency bands of the loud sounds in the time frames when the loud sounds were occurring. That seemed plenty scientific to me. And Jim went one step farther for the people complaining about the YouTube audio. He made the original unaltered audio files from any of the audio tests he's done. He's made them available for download in their original format from his website, so his critics don't have a leg to stand on. Okay, so the whole point of this video was so that I didn't have to respond individually to the critics of Jim Lill or Glenn Fricker who say that their experiments are not valid or scientific enough. Again, my challenge to you guys is can you do a better test? All any of us are trying to do here is provide you guys with some information and a better starting point than what we had so that you guys don't have to make as many mistakes buying gear as we did. That's it. I'm going to let Jim explain his mindset and his thought process himself. Every influential guitar tone was and is made up of a chain, starting with the player's decisions in their brain, execution with their hands, the pick, strings, guitar, pickup, cables, effects, amp, cab, and speaker. But then it doesn't stop there with the sound you hear in the room. It continues to the microphone, mic placement, and then into the world of the mix engineer where it's balanced with everything else and committed as the tone that the rest of the world will hear. That is how every tone we've ever loved got into our ears. So as far as the chain goes, all of these things are necessary, and some make a big difference, and some make a small difference. I'm doing my best to help figure out which things make a big difference, and which things make a small difference, with actual audio comparisons anyone can listen to, so we can all focus on how to get the tone we want, and I hope you join me in the future for more videos. Alright, go watch some Jim Lil videos. I'll be back next time with some actual guitar stuff, and until then, live well and rock hard.